It's that time of the day. The GB News pub has been declared open. I am delighted to say, and I'm joined by Paul Beaver, defence aviation expert and former editor-in-chief of Jane's Defence Weekly. Welcome. Thank you, Nigel. To the programme. With your good health. The timing, Paul, of getting you on is actually rather good because you were a freelance war correspondent. You've been an expert in BBC studios and Sky studios and, and, and kind of when you were involved with Jane's Defence Weekly, it was at a time the Falklands had been a few years before. We'd had the first Gulf War in Kuwait. Uh, we were, you know, on the verge of the next big military expeditions into Afghanistan and Iraq, which both of which lasted rather longer mm -hmm. uh, and cost rather more in terms of lives and money than we'd ever envisaged. But what really interests me about this is you were somebody then who was quite a regular part of this debate. Mm -hmm. And defence itself was a big part of the national debate. It was. And a big part of general elections and what we talked about. And there were some quite, well, it appeared, some quite big definitions between the Conservative and Labour parties on the importance of defence. And particularly on nuclear. If you remember, yes. nuclear deterrence was something that was particularly divided um, uh, the parties in the days of Michael Foote and, and Margaret Thatcher. Yes, Labour had nightmares. Yes, they did. Over that issue of unilateralism, yeah. Yeah. CND and all the rest of it. But the reason I say all of this is relevant now is we've had in the last few months the Taliban have taken over Afghanistan again. We've got China becoming... I would say increasingly bellicose mm -hmm. about the position. They know where they want to go. They have an agenda, as they always have done. Yes. And they're very happy to take that agenda forward. And they know that some parts of the West are weak. We might get really excited about uh, the Uyghur people, as, as we should do. Um, they don't really care about that. They're more interested in uh, fulfilling the dream of well, Hong Kong is is lost to the world now, it's now part of China. Taiwan next, who knows, the Nine Dash Line, the South China Sea. If, we, if I was still doing this <coughs> yeah. weekly, I'd be looking at that um, every week. But it isn't just that, is it? Because we've got uh, actually North Korea, mm -hmm. beginning to fire the little rocket man, as he was mm -hmm. called, firing rockets again. Mm -hmm. We've got Putin playing all sorts of, mm -hmm. well, maybe they're mind games, I don't know. We, and we don't. And, and we don't know. Yeah. You know, is, you know, the 100,000 troops, does he seriously want to invade the Ukraine? Or, I mean, or, or is he preying on the fact that we have a, an American president who's going through a very tough time politically? Mm -hmm. um, but really, Paul, the point I want to make to you is this. 30 years ago, this would have been a major part of our national news on a daily basis. Are we militarily prepared? At what level should we intervene? What are our NATO partners prepared to do? How is the uh, ongoing military and intelligence relationship with America? These would have been debated in the House of Commons. Uh, they, they would have become issues in by-elections. They've gone off the radar. Well, wow. they've gone off the radar, I think, for, for another number of reasons. I mean, defence has been subsumed by the whole security debate because of, of terrorism, Islamic terrorism in particular, but also the rise of, of the right-wing extremist groups in places like Germany and Poland. There's a lot of concern about that. So defence as it was, I think, is gone. There's a, there could be debate about cyber, but cyber isn't very newsworthy. So the great thing about debate uh, about defence 30 years ago, and I was running Jane's, was mm. it's about tanks and ships and aeroplanes. Yeah. And you can see those. I mean, politicians can touch them. You know, or even really good. appear in, in the turrets or, of or them. <laughs> yeah. and, and although that hasn't stopped our, our beloved Foreign Secretary, of course, from doing that uh, in the it last It was a very Thatcher-esque-looking picture. Uh, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was a really good picture <laughs> opportunity. I believe that uh, the current Secretary of State for Defence is currently in Sweden. I'm sure there'll be a picture tomorrow of him <laughs> up in the Arctic in the snow. Um, and that's important because that demonstrates to our northern allies and the northern group that we care about the north. So tick, well done, yeah. ben, ben, ben Wallace, for that. But our problem is most of what we talk about now is cyber. And Wiggly Amps are very difficult to, to talk about. Mm. It, how, do, how do you show cyber where you could do a matrix-style um, presentation? But actually, that's why I think it's gone off the boil. And a little bit, COVID obviously has swamped everything um, and the national debate. Um, Brexit to a certain extent, we could have debated quite nicely 
what happens in defence terms now. Well, well, I had this confrontation with Nick Clegg. Mm-hmm. Head-to-head public debates when he was Deputy Prime Minister. I did two of them with him and big national audiences. It was a big deal running up to the 2014 European elections. And I said to Clegg, one of the reasons I want to leave the European Union is I don't want to be part of a European army. Mm -hmm. And he described me as a dangerous fantasist for having dared to suggest it. And, of course, we know that the European Union is developing its own military capability. Can NATO coexist with European defence? Yes, I think it can. I I think you have to look at at how this works. Even even if the French are capable of putting a European army together, they will not have what are called the national strategic means uh, that the Americans have. We all rely on what the Americans have in space, and what they have in terms of their cyber capability. And and so I, I don't lose any sleep over this. And I'm I'm buoyed up by the fact that the United Kingdom is, is, is leading a new initiative called the Joint Expeditionary Force, which are, are if you like, uh, the 10 beer-drinking nations of Northern Europe. <laughs> Norway, Sweden, Finland, the Baltics. The beer-drinking. Uh, they are. The, the, yeah, they no, call no, 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 I get it, I get it, I get it. You know, they, they call themselves this. You know, the Dutch are yeah. involved, and even Iceland came on board in, 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 in April this year. Now, the, uh, Iceland doesn't have an army. It just have a, has an unsinkable aircraft carrier. So we have the Jeff. The great thing about the Jeff is only 10 nations. But actually, we don't need to have that whole NATO or European Union panoply of bureaucracy. It's a matter of the defence secretary. So is this, is this recasting? Well, I don't think it's recasting. I think it's going in a new direction. I'm very excited by Interesting. it. Interesting. Very, very I, I think it's a really good way. But we haven't debated it. Most people in Britain have never heard of the Jeff. Yeah. And, and I think I think that's that's really a, a great. That is very interesting, and of course the AUKUS deal as well. And indeed, where the French, who wanted to sell them 20th century technology, mm-hmm. have been replaced by us and the Americans mm-hmm. selling them 21st century technology. Mm-hmm. So, so there are some good things happening. Are we spending enough money on defence? Oh, we never do. Um, uh, our problem is that. Um, actually, we have got the fourth largest defence budget in the world. Are you spending our money properly is perhaps a better question. And I think there's a lot of waste. I think there's a, we could change the way we procure. I mean, there's some really serious procurement issues. But, Nigel, there always have been. I mean, when I started doing this 35 years ago, we, we had problems with, with defence procurement. We've still got problems with defence procurement. I don't know the solution. No. Aviation, Paul. Aviation. I, oh. show, I, I, showed, I showed a clip here. Do you want Spitfires? Oh, absolutely. Yes, So yes, I know yes. what you feel about Spitfires. Yes. Um, so I brought along some books. I think you've already got my book, Spitfire People. I do. I do. Um, I but, do. But I thought I'd bring along my, my picture book. Um, so Spitfire Evolution. There are 73 variants of the Spitfire in there. That's fantastic. I um, love it. So that's one for I love you it. to, I love to it. take well, I've, home and, and I've, read. I've grown up very, you know, not too far away from Biggin Hill. And I used to go exactly. to every summit of the airfare, and I've got so many biographies of Battle of Britain pilots signed. Um, and I'm involved with a little little museum at Shoreham in Kent, There's Battle a lovely of Britain one. Museum. Lovely one down there. And, 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 of course, there were Navy pilots in the Battle of Britain that nobody's heard of. For a, I, showed, I showed a clip on Monday mm-hmm. of Pearl Harbor. It was the mm-hmm. 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. For those watching this, who perhaps younger generation, who don't know much about the Battle of Britain, just give us, you've got a, a 90 seconds to tell us, about the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire, the Hurricane, and the men that fought in it, and why it mattered. The Battle of Britain is significant because it was the first aerial engagement. It was the first real battle fought from the air. But it wasn't the fact that the Hurricanes and Spitfires and Defiance and Blenheims and the young men who flew them, or the radars, or any of that, won it. It was because the whole nation got behind the Royal Air Force Fighter Command. So they were the tip of the spear, the very tip of the spear, 2,900 of them, um, of which about 550 were killed, of something like 16 nations uh, involved. Um, Not as many Poles as most people would believe, actually. um, But uh, the first people to step forward, New Zealand. And it's really interesting when you look at the at the numbers. Why is it really important? Because it's the first time that the Nazi war machine was stopped. Why is it also important? It's because it proved that our air defence system worked. Integrated air defence system, the Dowding system, it allowed us then to develop um, other systems and when it came to the bomber campaign as well. Always remember, more bomber crews died in the Battle of Britain supporting fighter command 
than fight, uh, fighter crews died. So that, I think, is an important thing. Why is it important? Because it didn't turn the tide of the war. It just gave the Germans something to think about. If we hadn't stopped the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, we would have, we would have been invaded, wouldn't we? Yes. The, the, your, then quest, your then question should be after that, would it have been successful when they got a beachhead? I, I think the army, although it didn't have equipment because it left a lot of it in France. It was Dunkirk, wasn't it? In Dunkirk. Yeah. But the navy was <coughs> still very formidable. And the Germans had no landing craft as such. They were going to use barges. Uh, they would have needed to have captured ports, Shoreham perhaps, New Haven, places like that. Yeah. Um, so would it have been successful? I'd, probably, I'd, I'd say no. But if we hadn't had the Battle of Britain and um, the whole of that national uh, operation, I think the Germans would have had a go. And it would have been perhaps the time that Britain would have sued for peace. And that would have been catastrophic. On that note, Paul Beaver... I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us here on Talking Pints.